Coming up on Stu Does America, Glenn Beck is in the studio, and what he has to say is going to change the way you think about the world. Texas makes some important strides in the battle for our children's lives, and we're starting to see one of the inevitable consequences of Joe Biden's disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal. So let's do the new refugee crisis. drink. It's one of those shows. Thank you so much for joining us. In just a little bit, we're going to have Glenn back on. And I will say, uh, to give you a little behind the scenes of the program, today we actually taped our interview with Glenn before we started the show. It's the first thing we did today. And it went in a direction I really did not expect. In fact, it's sort of caused me to change what we're doing today on the show. Uh, Glenn is kind of carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, which is probably not a healthy thing to do. Um, but he's kind of gone into a, a mode of doing everything he can to try to f fix this situation in the Middle East. And I don't th know if it's possible for somebody, uh, you know, a guy who hosts a talk show to do that. I can tell you that talking to an audience like this, like our radio audience, like the audience of The Blaze, has been able to generate the resources to actually make a difference in this situation. And Glenn is doing the best he can to monitor that situation, sometimes, uh, to, to, that, sometimes to affect uh, to him personally. Uh, I think you'll get some of that out of the conversation we have here in just a few minutes. So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to that in a couple of minutes, but let me, let me give you an update as to where we are right now in the Afghanistan situation. To show you how pathetic this effort has been from President Joe Biden, I wish to, we could give you all sorts of numbers. We can give you all sorts of big picture sort of analysis on this, but let me zoom in for a moment. Let me give you a very specific story. This goes back to 2008. As a private security team with former uh, firm Blackwater uh, and US Army soldiers, as they were kind of going through uh, Afghanistan. Said in 2008, two Army Black Hawk helicopters made an emergency landing in Afghanistan during a blinding snowstorm on board that aircraft. John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, two former senators, and of course, Senator at the time, Joe Biden. So Joseph Robinette Biden is in the middle of Afghanistan in a snowstorm and he lands and Blackwater is trying to monitor the area for Taliban fighters. This is at the time when the Taliban was our enemy. Now, of course, they're good friends and security officers for us. Uh, they decided to, they were in trouble. They send out a call for help. Now there's this place nearby called Bagram Airfield, which is a, a really helpful thing to have when you're in a crisis. Shockingly, we don't have that anymore either. We didn't have that during the evacuation. But when the craft to come out to uh, aircraft came out to help Biden and his fellow senators uh, from Bagram, on board that particular aircraft was a guy named Mohammed. Mohammed came and helped as an interpreter with President Joe Biden in the middle of a crisis. There's a photo of Joe Biden. And, and John Kerry all hanging out with Muhammad. Muhammad was one of these guys that didn't just interpret or translate. He legitimately just helped us fight a war. Listen to this description. Muhammad spent much, most of his time in a tough valley where the soldiers said he was in more than 100 firefights with them. Again, these are the words of our military saying this guy was in 100 firefights on our side. The soldiers trusted him so much that they would sometimes give him a weapon to use if they got in trouble when they went into tough areas. This guy was actually basically a part of our military. He actually helped Joe Biden in a crisis. Where is he now? Stuck in Afghanistan. 
<laughs> yes, he's one of the people we promised we would get out and is still there. We took you through the Janu uh, July 8th speech from Joe Biden. Again, this is less than two months ago where he promised uh, that absolutely every one of these guys were going to be out because we weren't going to just like turn over the, the country to the Taliban in over a weekend. There's no possible circumstance in which we're taking people off the roof of our embassy in helicopters. That would be crazy. Two months later, of course, that's all come and gone. The whole argument about that came, that went, then it turned into what an amazing airlift. We should give props to the administration for all the hard work they put in. They were asked about this report uh, that Muhammad is still stuck in Afghanistan. By the way, he's, ple he's pleading to the president. Um, he said, uh, hello, Mr. President, save me and my family. Don't forget me here. He's got four kids hanging out in Afghanistan. Jen Psaki was asked about it, and she was really, uh, you want to talk about someone who has really, I think, felt the empathy. Um, she said, our message to him is thank you. Thank you for fighting by our side the last 20 years. This is a joke. Who are these people? Thank you for the role you played in helping a number of my favorite people out of a snowstorm and for all the work you did. Oh, wow. I mean, that's that. It almost seems too sincere, doesn't it? And don't worry, by the way, our commitment to Afghanistan is enduring, says Jen Psaki. And I know I believe her. I know I believe her uh, completely and entirely. Now, the EU is trying to grapple with what are they going to do in this situation? Because, as you know, in the past, they've basically criticized the United States for not taking any refugees. Now people are like, well, can you take some of these refugees? And they're like, yeah, not, maybe not this time. Maybe not. This. We did the Syria thing in 2015. There are certain countries that are saying, OK, you can we, we can take some refugees. But uh, many countries in the EU are, are, are holding off on that. They don't necessarily want to go down that road again. And it's understandable because we don't know who is, we don't know how the vetting is. Now, if you are involved in the Nazarene Fund uh, effort, you may have heard us talking about this. Now, you know, we obviously have connection. I'm, I've never been to Afghanistan myself. I've got a timeshare there. I've just never made it. Every time I try to book the thing, it's already taken. And it's really frustrating. You know, I keep paying these maintenance fees and I can never get to Jalalabad. You know, it's just, I guess that's on me. But uh, there is... There are a lot of organizations that have been active in Afghanistan for a long time and people we've worked with for a long time. And the Nazarene Fund has taken those relationships that have existed for years and years and they have uh, taken out people that they feel very comfortable with, that have been vetted, and they're taking them to third party nations. So like if you're thinking of the best case scenario, people who are likely going to be murdered are vetted, then removed and placed in a third party nation. That's kind of the best case scenario, I think, for the United States. Not necessarily what the Biden administration is doing, of course. Josh Rogan uh, tweets this. There are approximately 278 unaccompanied children among the thousands of new Afghan refugees now under the care of the U.S. government, according to State Department unclassified cable from this morning that I obtained. Uh, you know, look. I, do I think uh, some child that's four years old is going to be a problem in the United States? No, <laughs> certainly not for a while. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, U.S. citizens when they're four year old, they seem pretty cute and then they grow up, unfortunately. And then they're the people that like cut you off uh, when you're driving. That could happen, right? We don't know. But it is odd and, and a little scary that they're not vetted enough to know if they're even with their parents. You know, we, we don't know what this, how this is going to uh, play out. We do know that removing people like Muhammad, who actually did help us, would be a good idea. However, that guy is still there. And we have thousands of people who I don't know how carefully they've been vetted. Obviously, in a crisis situation, people you think are legit, you can take them to a third party nation. You could take them to an air base in another area, someplace where they're safe until we can figure out exactly what the situation is. We don't want them murdered for no reason. On the other hand, we also want to make sure that we're doing our best to the people that do come here are the people that we want to be here. I don't know if there's a lot of people out there who would say someone who fought in a hundred firefights with our, uh, with our troops on our side, with our guns because our military trusted them so much that they didn't even mind giving them a gun. I think that's the type of, that's the type of person who likes America enough that you probably do want them here, right? 
I mean, that's certainly the way I feel. You know, when we have legal immigration, a lot of times it works out really well for us. Illegal immigration, not so much. But I want to take a minute here because we're going to have Glenn uh, on in a second. And I want to take a minute to kind of just look at what we did in Afghanistan. One of the things that I think is is playing with people's heads right now is the idea that in two th- in you know 2001 we go in to Afghanistan, Taliban's in control, we kick them all out, and we kill a bunch of them, and then we stay there for 20 years. And at the end of the 20 years, Taliban's back in control, and it feels like you know we were there for nothing and never did anything. Nothing ever benefited anyone. But let me just give you a little taste of what we actually did do in Afghanistan. And that's, uh, let me get, this is a chart. This is a chart of the uh, educational progress in Afghanistan uh, for women. How many women, little girls actually, are going to primary school? Well, you see the chart, and I will explain it for those on podcast. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. We happen to be reviewing and subscribing today, of course. But you see that from about 1980 to about 1996, the amount of girls that went to school was like 20%. That's not good. But that's also pre-Taliban. Taliban took control in 1996 and dropped it from 20% to 0%. 0% of girls went to school. We went in there and, as you see, raised it from 0 up past the 20% it used to be, all the way up to 60 and then 70 and then 80 and then mid-80s. 83% is where it, it leaves off right now. 83% of girls going to school. Now look, is that the United States? Is that something that, you know, I don't know, New Jersey would be proud of? Well, maybe New Jersey, I don't know. But, you know, a, a U.S. state, would they be proud of it? Probably not. But 83% is a hell of a lot better, not only than when the Taliban was there, but when the regime before the Taliban was there. We... We keep looking at this and saying, well, uh, we didn't do anything. Nothing, nothing happened there. Well, then what are, we, what are we mourning? We're mourning a much better situation for the people who live there. And it's going away. Now, look, it's not our job to make sure Afghanistan is basically a, a vacation paradise. That's, I mean, I've got the timeshare there. You don't. But I will say that we should at least acknowledge that life is a lot better for people there than it was not only when the Taliban was there, but before the Taliban was there. There's a big change to that society. And it really hurts to, uh, to see people who had a chance at some sort of life being flushed down the toilet by the Taliban. I don't know. I mean, what, we're supposed to now sit here and trust that they're going to do a great job there. And I will say, it is not our job. It's not our job to sit there and micromanage that situation. It's only our job to act in our own self-interest. When it comes to foreign policy, that's our gig. But we have to acknowledge that the reason we did this was, number one, because we thought it would improve the society so that these things would not occur down the road. And we'll see if that, if that happens. But number two, one of the side benefits was making life a lot better for millions of people. And unfortunately, that's going down the tubes now, even for people like Mohammed, who sat there and actually helped save Joe Biden's life in a crisis. Not even that is good enough to be treated uh, in a way that is just I mean, I'm not even asking for special treatment. I'm just asking for keeping our promises to people who fought alongside and at times actually saved military lives. We've seen we've talked to military members who have had people who were Afghan citizens, who actually saved their lives. There's reporting of this all over the place. That doesn't mean everybody who wants in to the the fabulous uh, buffet that is the United States of America gets in. It means we need to be careful. We need to be sober about this. We need to be realistic about it. But we do need to keep our promises. And what is happening now is the exact opposite of that. Glenn Beck is next with an interview you do not want to miss. Don't go anywhere. Before that, I want to tell you about something that Glenn loves, Built Bars. Built Bars are, let me tell you the little path of Built Bars around this place. Started with my wife, Lisa Page. And she has a little uh, Instagram page called Lisa Page Made Me Do It. And basically, she convinces people to buy things. 
usually after we've already had to buy them. So if you're wondering where my salary goes, you now know. Uh, but she bought Bilt Bars and loved them and told Tanya, Glenn's wife, about them. Tanya loved them. Tanya told Glenn about them. And Glenn, of course, didn't eat them for a very long time because she used the dirty word to describe them, healthy. Look, fool yourself. Forget that they're healthy for a second. Just think of coconut and mint brownie and double chocolate and salted caramel and cookies and cream. Think of all the incredible flavors because Bilt Bar leads with taste first. They make sure they taste fantastic and then they make sure, hey, 180 calories. Yeah, we're still in there. Uh, 18 grams of protein. There's a new, I noticed a new bo box of Bilt Bars in my fridge yesterday that were pistachio and they were like 160 calories. Only four to five grams of sugar, four to five net carbs. They are healthy, but also taste really good. Built.com is the place to go. Built.com. Use the promo code Stu15. You'll get 15% off your first order. The promo code is Stu15 for Built.com. Stu15 for 15% off at Built.com. Glenn Beck is next. Joining me once again in studio is Glenn Beck. His newest special premieres immediately after this program at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, so I want to get into this special here in a minute, but you just walked in here uh, coming out of a briefing about mm -hmm. what's going on with the Nazarene Fund, and it, it seems like it's pretty intense. I get these briefings about three times a day now, um, and uh, they tell me what's going on, good news and bad news. And uh, I was told, prepare yourself for this one. This is bad news. And uh, no, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, our government is so out of control. And I, I, you know what the briefing was. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine anything that I want to do more than go on the air mm. and scream this from the highest mountaintop? Yes. Okay. You would like, yes. I can't tell you right now what is going on, but... We're talking crimes against humanity. We are at that level with our government. It is, it, it is, I've stood at the burning, smoldering rubble of the World Trade Center. I, it took me 10 years at least to get the smell out of my nose, okay? I've seen bad before. I've had bad briefings before. I've seen really horrible things happen in my life. Nothing, nothing, nothing like this. I would renounce my citizenship like that. It, what does it mean to be an American anymore? Evil. You know, I said early this morning at what, seven o'clock this morning, Pat came in and said, I call this evil. And I was like, well, that's not right. evil evil it's so tough to talk about this because there's so much we can't talk about and i you know i we only can't talk about it because it's all in play and if we expose things now uh but i i i i got i have news for everybody involved in this everybody involved in this uh i i went in and i put my chips on the table i know how it could end for me and anybody else that's involved in this. I already know, but I got news for you. To my dying breath, to my dying day, I will work to expose you. And believe me, if the American people find out what you are doing right now, uh, all your chips are going to be gone. You belong in jail. So the, how did the briefing go? Was it good and positive? <laughs> it was really good. Okay. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, the play was fine. <laughs> I mean, I, I know we can't say specifics. I know we can't go into the details, um, but... I, I, one of the guests on the show tonight is the guy who is our COO of the Nazarene Fund. You know him. Mm-hmm. He is, I think he's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He's been on the National Security Council. He's beside himself right now. He's beside himself. So is this, can this be explained with typical government nope. bureaucracy? No, nope. no, nope. no. 
No. It can't be. No, it cannot can be, it be explained. Compl- can it there, be? There, uh, there, there were things that I've seen the State Department do recently that uh, I know that there's a 95% chance that was just stick the knife and twist. But this 100% evil, knowing evil, 100%, no way out of that one. Can it be explained by, you know, I don't like Glenn Beck and I don't want to help Glenn Beck. If you are out of your mind crazy, if, if you're willing to put the lives of people, I swear to you, one of these people doesn't return. One of these people doesn't return. Oh, my gosh. It, I don't care what your motivation is. We've seen reports that there have been uh, ways for people, Americans even, to get out. Not necessarily related to your um, uh, efforts, but even other private efforts Mm. and the government, the state department has shut those things down. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're looking at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, can you come up with no a motivation? No, you can't. No, you know, the story. I know you don't know it is in detail because yeah, yeah. I just shouted it for across the <laughs> yeah, so. 16,000 square foot room here. Yeah. But you know the story. Could you come up with something? No. I mean, from what I understand, no. No. You know, no. But- no. And it, 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 it went on for hours. Hours. Senators were involved. Congressmen were involved. For hours, we fought against them. I went to sleep last night and got up this morning thinking that it had been solved. Oh, no, 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 no. It's... I'm telling you, Stu, you do not want to be a part of this country if this is where we're going. We need to move to Canada, to, uh, to Mexico, uh, hell, to Germany at this point. Now you said you now you're saying you want to move before that you said you wanted to renounce your citizenship you're about the most i mean they used to call you jingoistic as an insult in I, the news I all have, the time you're one I of the most have, patriotic people i've ever met i to quote jefferson i have sworn on the altar of god to fight against tyranny to fight against this. And the best tool in the world's quiver has always been the United States. But if this is what the United States of America, the government and the State Department decide to do, I want no part of it. No part of it. No part of it. And that kills me to say that. How? 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 What does my citizenship mean? What, what are my taxes? What are my taxes paying for? Seriously. And I don't mean like, what are my taxes paying for? This is ridiculous. They're just wasting the money. I mean, what are you actually funding? What are you actually doing that I don't know if you'll do this in front of me? I, 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 I. So isn't though... If it is the best quiver, isn't it worth fighting for? Yes, it is. And uh, I just, I mean, we're just going to keep doing what we have to do. And uh, I I just... uh, I've said this for so long. There will come a time that you won't recognize your country, but I never thought it would be like this. I never thought it would be like this. I don't recognize my country at all. I don't know who they are. You know, I, I feel that like there are, I've had a, a version of that same 
feeling just looking at what I, you know, public information, the news, watching how this has all taken place. I talked to uh, our friend Spencer Corson last week, who was there, who was fighting. Yep. We talked to Jason Buttrell as well, yep. who was there and went through this in Afghanistan. And it, I feel like that's, inc- I mean, obviously not to the level that you're talking about because you know a lot behind the scenes that others don't, but I, I mean, from veterans to everyday people, I don't think people can understand what's going on here right now. And I'm not sure I'm the guy to bring it to them anymore. What do you I, mean? I don't. <laughs> the decisions that I have made in the last two weeks included. The things that I say now are impacting people's lives. I'm sure, I'm sure, whatever it is I've just said out of my passion, I'm sure it's going to cost more. I am not. Now, wait a minute, though. But you're not telling people to go to certain... I mean, you're no, not but a, a control of these operations, and people make their own decisions. You can't blame yourself for You it. know I said something on the air today, and literally four minutes later, I got an email. Whatever you do, things have changed. Don't say this. And I said it four minutes before. And that's going to affect the operations. And that's affecting the people who are good people inside trying to fight it. Right. And of course, to be clear, you didn't know you were supposed to say that. I mean, what are you supposed to do? You're a human being. You're trying to do your best. Everybody I talk to, and I've talked to tons of people since all this started, says nothing but thank you. I mean, they say it through me, but they're saying and it to you. They shouldn't say it to me. They should say it to all the other people who are actually on the ground. It's not just the Nazarene Fund. You know what we did? You know what I did? I sat in a very nice, comfortable studio, and I asked people to rise above it and to give money. That's it. That's, that's it. That's what I did. All of these other people who are not getting any credit, who are not getting any sleep, who are working day and night and getting punched in the face and they don't have a microphone where you can just vent and vomit. They have to take it and they have no place to go and they are not known. Those are the people that deserve the credit. Those are the people and those are the people that we are going to focus on on our radio program. I want the people to know their names. I want those organizations known because it's not the Nazarene Fund. We are blessed with the greatest audience ever. And when (laughs) the way it has been working until last night, until this latest, but the way what happened last night, is that because I've I've said too much already? Is that what's happening? I don't know. I don't know. I just know it's evil. I just know I don't care who gets the credit. I don't care who gets the blame. Just save these people. Many of them were Americans. Were Americans. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? Sorry, I should go off the air. I have another show to prepare for. All right. Well, tonight's program, you're going to be talking about, I think, something very closely connected to all of this. There is no way. (laughs) uh, There is no way that I can uh, avoid that. But just know this. What you're going to hear tonight, it's not even that the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Mm. The names aren't even being mentioned 
to protect the guilty as sin just in case that person could do even more evil and have more people killed and leave more people behind. Crimes against humanity. The only reason why we are not saying anything is because maybe there's a chance, a chance that they won't take retribution out. But God, you cannot hide from God and God will have justice. All right, Glenn Beck, it's tonight, uh, right after this program, uh, more about this. And uh, I can tell you uh, for certain that we'll be covering this on radio as well. Uh, at some point, maybe we'll know this whole story. And oh, you will. <laughs> I have a feeling oh, we you might. Will. I have a feeling we might. And you need to remember, Glenn, that just as you say, these people who are doing all this great work over there, that's their role. And your role is something different. Nobody wants you trying to rescue people in Afghanistan. That would not go well. Oh, it would not go well. You do what you do well. We would be stopping. The audience, Where the hell the... is the Dunkin' Donuts here? <laughs> what kind of civilization is it without a Dunkin' Remember, Donuts? Remember, the audience is in that same position. Though. I know. They can't go there either. And they're doing everything they can to work through, through you and the radio show and get the money to the right people uh, who can actually do these things. And, you know, you've done a hell of a lot of good here, man. Don't. I know. We all have, and we all play our roles. I know that. I know that. I know that. It's just, uh, we just have to keep our roles into perspective. BlazeTV.com slash stew is the place to go to uh, get it to uh, YouTube as well. Uh, we'll be back in a second. So it's a pretty big development in the pro-life battle uh, here over the past 24 hours as Texas, where I sit right now, um, has passed a new law. And it's interesting because it basically bans, uh, well, here's how it's being discussed. It bans abortion at six weeks. That's like a heartbeat bill. We've seen these heartbeat bills passed before. Obviously, there's a big situation going on with a, a case in Mississippi that's going to the Supreme Court that is really seen as a more direct challenge to Roe versus Wade. Maybe that overturns Roe versus Wade. Maybe that allows for more restrictions. We'll see how that goes later on. This case went, uh, went through um, some of this process and they tried to get the Supreme Court to block this law in Texas from taking hold. And the Supreme Court basically just looked the other way, said we're not, take, we're not dealing with this right now. That means it goes into effect as of today. Now, the law is different. It's interesting. So basically, normally what you do is you pass a law and you say, hey, you can't give you know, abortions past X amount of weeks. If you do, you, know, you, could, you could get charged, right? It's a crime. It could, be, uh, it could be a fine. It could be imprisonment for the people running the facility, whatever it might be. And that would be, of course, implemented as a punishment by the state. That's not what this does at all. In fact, it, it specifically does not allow the state to be involved in the punishment or enforcement in any way. So instead of saying like, here's a bill we're gonna pass and we're gonna use this to challenge Roe versus Wade, what they're saying is if we format it this way, we don't have to deal with Roe versus Wade. It goes kind of around the system. And the way they do that is to allow regular everyday private citizens to sue a facility who is uh, doing these abortions any later than a heartbeat shows up. And so I, it's an interesting sort of legal approach. I don't know how it's going to work, honestly. I don't know that I necessarily like the approach exactly. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I like the result if it stops abortions. You know I'm 100% on that. I do wonder how this a sort of approach would be utilized by a left-leaning state, you know, a left-leaning state that, let's say, uh, they decide to put in some un unfair vaccine mandate and you want to take a vaccine, well, maybe everyone around you can sue you. You know, like, there's a lot of weird things that could result from this sort of approach as it kind of goes around the normal process, but 
kind of leave that to the side right now. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work. I will say that uh, neither Biden or Saki like it, so it's probably pretty great. I mean, that's my, base, my, my basic understanding of how these things work. Um, but Biden says that the uh, that this law blatantly violates the constitutional right established by the Supreme Court's 1973 decision on Roe versus Wade. And that's an interesting way to phrase it. That's actually the phrasing from, I think, Axios, not Biden's phrasing. Um, the constitutional right established by the Supreme Court's 1973 decision on Roe versus Wade. I'm not sure if you know anything about, um, uh, it's called um, the United States of America, um, but the Supreme Court can't establish a constitutional right. That is not how this works. In theory, in theory, and again, Roe versus Wade is a ridiculous decision, but in theory, what Roe versus Wade said was that this right already existed in the Constitution. We just didn't have like the, the thing that would show the magical invisible ink. So they went really hard to find out and see, hey, uh, you know, we've got this inv invisible ink we found on the Constitution, and that creates this right to privacy that gives you the right to abortion. If the Supreme Court is establishing the right to abortion, then the rights aren't going through the correct process. Obviously, they're going to be against this. They're going to act as if it is the craziest, worst thing you've ever heard in your life. But I love this particular thread uh, from Dr. Uh, Dara Cass, um, MD. And she's giving some advice to people. If you, just, if, you, if you just are so super excited about abortion and you just really want to go get one, she's got some advice for how to deal with this. And I think it's fascinating. She says, I spent last night thinking of medical workarounds for this horrific law until it's rectified in the courts. So this is what I would tell my daughter or her friends if they were in Texas. Um, I know this isn't enough, but as a mom and a doctor, I am sharing my thoughts. Get on birth control now. Any form that is reliable, oral contraceptives, NuvaRing, Norplant, IUD, something now. Stopping here for a second. Aren't you sort of acknowledging that you don't need the abortion thing? Are you telling your kids, your daughter, their friends that really you don't have to worry about birth control because you've always got the abortion thing to fall back on? That seems like terrible advice in every way. Even people who say that, oh, look, I'm just, I, I, I just am for the women's right to choose. Well, okay, but like, why wouldn't you have them on birth control earlier then, right? Isn't that an easier way to choose? Use condoms with the birth control every single time. No exceptions. This is good practice for STI protection anyway. So again, why are you recommending it for this problem? Take a pregnancy test every four and a half to five weeks. How much sex are you having? It's an incredible amount of sex. Um, buy a bunch of pregnancy tests now. Can you imagine giving this advice to your daughter? Hey, honey, I know, I know you're having like incredible amounts of sex all the time, so much so that you might just get pregnant at any moment. So every four and a half weeks, get a, take a pregnancy test, no matter what, whether you think you're pregnant or not. And that way you can still abort the thing before you get past six weeks. Good luck, honey. Go to school now. She says, um, get them in bulk. <laughs> I love this. So we're going to have a run on pregnancy test. This may feel redundant if you're on birth control, but time is of the essence. Capital letters with this law. Knowledge is your only power. If you find out you're pregnant and do not want to be, you have very little time to do it. Do not shut down. This will be hard, but you can't delay. Call me. We will figure this out together. Understand how to seek a mega medical abortion. There are ways to safely seek care privately, even if you need to leave the state to do it. And this is one of the things I brought up many, many times. I don't know if we need to go any, any more on this stuff, but even if Roe versus Wade was completely overturned and you were in Texas, you know what you need to do? Go to the next state over because guaranteed New Mexico is going to keep abortion legal. I know it's inconvenient. I know everybody wants to kill their kids right down the street from their house. You know, it would be nice if we could all do it at the, uh, at the Circle K or the 7-Eleven and just get it over with. But you may need to do some minor travel. You may, we may be talking about a 30-minute flight to get your abortion. I know it's inconvenient, but them's the cost of uh, being able to just wipe that kid off the planet. I don't feel like it's that much to ask, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. Back in a second. So 
Have you been following this uh, high school football scandal that's going on? ESPN runs uh, an occasional high school football games between big powerhouse schools. And they decided to run one between IMG Academy and Bishop Sycamore. Now, IMG Academy is this like very well-known powerhouse, like all sorts of Division I you know, players coming out of it. Bishop Sycamore apparently also had uh, Division I players coming out of it. Well, that kind of held until they got on the field. And it seemed as if they weren't very good at football. In fact, they wound up losing 58 to nothing in the game against IMG Academies. It was so dramatic that the ESPN announcers even thought, like, this, there's something wrong with this. They even were talking about how some of these players, some of the stuff isn't adding up. Apparently, the roster that was provided to ESPN and the promoter of the event was not actually the roster of the players that showed up to play the game. They eventually started, you know, people have now started looking into this, and they went to, it was supposedly a school in Ohio, but it's not listed as a charter school in the state of Ohio. Um, they don't really have a website. They, uh, no one knows where they are. In fact, they don't seem to actually have a school. Minor issue. Uh, they seem to be an online-only school that has met only a few times. It seems to be some weird scam to get on, you know, to like, to, to play these tough, top-notch football teams. And I don't know, profit off of it somehow. Um, the, when they started looking into this, the coach of the team is actually wanted for a crime. He's since been fired. They tried to raise funds, $20,000 for its football team, it raised $140. This is a team that made it onto ESPN for a nationally televised game. Um, the other thing was they played that game on, a, I believe it was a Sunday. They had played another game on the previous Friday. Now, you don't play high school football games two days apart. That, like, doesn't happen. Not really safe. It looked very uh, much like it was one of these situations that somebody wanted to make some cash and decided this would be a cool scam. And it, it's a little bit of a victim of its own success as it rose to the prominence level to be able to get on national TV. And when people saw it, they started looking after it and saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on? Now, it, it, it appears ESPN has come up with a new policy to look in to the teams they're putting on the, on the TV a little bit clo closer. Luckily, it doesn't seem like anyone got seriously hurt when you had, you know, secondary type athletes going up against top notch division one people. Uh, luckily, no one died in the game. At least you have that going for you, which is which is nice. Congratulations to Joe Biden, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan's person of the year. Congratulations. Wow. Taliban Joe. Celebrate that honor at Taliban Joe Merch .com. Taliban Joe merch.com. All right, so here's what happened. Guy goes through a stoplight on a motorcycle going really fast. As he goes through the stoplight, he turns around, looks at the cops, makes eye contact with them, and then just basically dares them and, and, and runs away uh, on his motorcycle. Up Speeds up to 100 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic, blowing through red lights, all the things you're not supposed to do. Now, late, they, the cops break off the pursuit, but eventually catch up with him later on in the night after 10 o'clock after he had just stopped his motorcycle at an intersection. They asked him what he was doing. Why was he running from the police? He said he was trying to show off for the girl who was on the back of his motorcycle. That girl who said she was screaming at him to stop, but he refused. That girl was his date. They were on their first date. <laughs> you imagine you're on your first date and you're just like, I'm just gonna go 100 miles an hour and run from the cops. I mean, at least you know she's exciting. Um, but I don't think the relationship lasted, unfortunately. Sad, sad, sad story.